gospel reading today comes from Matthew, the third chapter, and the first twelve verses. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This is the gospel of our Lord. Well, it's been pretty evident from our sharing time today that we are all aware that we live in a world that has its full share of trouble. Isn't that true? That's right. We do live in troubled times. We have in our world today wars and rumors of wars. We have troubles in our nation and in our province <coughs> and in our town and in our homes and often in our hearts. On that first Christmas night, a great company of heaven's angels appeared to a group of shepherds outside the town of Bethlehem. And what was the message that they sang? Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. That's Luke chapter 2, verse 14. That's probably a verse that you'll hear several times over this Christmas season, isn't it? On this second Sunday of Advent, the theme is peace. Peace in a troubled time. God's Word says, peace, peace to those far and near, says the Lord. Isaiah 57 and verse 19. God desires peace for all people, people near and far. But the sad fact is that not everyone experiences peace in their life. Why is it that so many people are not experiencing peace in their hearts? There could be a number of answers to that question. One of which is found in Isaiah 57 and verse 21. There is no peace, says my God. For the wicked. Hmm. When we live lives of wickedness, which means lives that are filled with sin, we cannot expect to experience peace in our hearts. The prophet Isaiah foretold of the coming of the Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Chapter 11 of Isaiah, which was read for us earlier, speaks about that coming one who would bring peace. But Isaiah also predicted that God would send a messenger before the Messiah to prepare the way for him. Matthew's Gospel makes it clear that that messenger was John the Baptizer or John the Baptist. And all of the other Gospels agree with that. 
that he was the one. Let's listen again to the first three verses of Matthew chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, here's his message, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. The voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Now this John was certainly a straight talker, wasn't he? He didn't beat around the bush. His message was clear. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come. What does it mean to repent? To repent means to turn away from sin and turn toward God. Sin is anything that is contrary to the nature and the character of God. And why should they repent? Because, he said, the kingdom of heaven is near. It was near in the person of the king who was coming. Now John, based on the description that the Bible gives us, John would never have been featured in GQ magazine. <laughs> his clothing was rough. And his diet was a little strange. The Bible says that John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. I'm, I'm with him on the leather belt and the wild honey. <coughs> Not so much on the camel's hair and the locusts, especially the locusts. But he had a message that was powerful and a message that was needed in his time and a message that's still needed in our time. And the Bible tells us that many people came to hear him. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of Jordan. And what did they do? Verse 6 says, Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. You know, we pray for peace. But the Bible tells us that as long as we hide iniquity in our hearts, the Lord will not hear us. That sin that we leave unconfessed separates us from a God who is holy. <coughs> When you repent, when you turn away from sin and wickedness and turn toward God, you need to come to Him on His terms. There's a little plaque in my office that was given to me by Laurie Fraser that says something like, uh, many people want to serve God, but only as advisors. <laughs> God doesn't need our advice. He doesn't need us trying to dictate to him the terms on which we will have a relationship. He doesn't even allow for negotiation in the relationship. God, I'll do such and such and such if you'll do this or that. That's not the way it works. God lays down the terms. And he says that we must confess our sins. Confess that we are sinners. Admit that we are a sinner. You know, that's a thing that people in general find very difficult to do. It's so much easier to make excuses for the wrong that we do than it is to confess it. We don't like to admit that we're sinners. And in fact, we may even be a little offended that uh, God expects us to confess our sin. We need to realize that we have offended God by our unbelief and our rebellion. And the first step in coming to God is to confess our sin. Until we confess our sin, admit that we are sinners, we remain separated from God, and as long as we are separated from God, we cannot experience His peace in our lives. As we read the passage, we see that when the people repented and confessed their sin, they were baptized. If you have repented of your sin and received Jesus as your Savior and Lord, you need to be baptized. Now, many people today treat baptism as if it were an option. 
you know, something that you can do if you want to when you get around to it someday, maybe. But the Bible teaches the importance of baptism for all those who repent and turn to God. In fact, if you are unwilling to be baptized, you need to take a good hard look into your heart and say, have you really repented at all? Because when we repent of our sin and we turn toward God, we desire to follow Him in obedience and in faith. If you confess your sin and are baptized, there is to be something to show for it. In other words, there should be a change in the way that you live. John the Baptist said, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. What kind of fruit is God looking for? Well, there could be a couple different answers to that question, which would be correct answers. One comes to us in Galatians and chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the kind of fruit that God is looking for. And the Bible also tells us to let our light so shine before people that they will see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. That good work is something that God is looking for when we have had a change of heart and want to live for Him. Now among those who came to hear John, there were Pharisees and Sadducees. That was two different groups, two different religious groups that were quite different from one another, but they had something in common. They were both very proud of the fact that they were indeed very religious. Now, there's nothing wrong with religion, if it's the right kind of religion. You'll hear some people say, well, I'm not religious. People ask me if I'm religious, I have to ask them a question. What do you mean by religious? The Bible says that true religion takes care of widows and orphans. It, it reaches out to meet the needs of people who are hurting. But there is a kind of religion that is self-righteous. Just look at me. Aren't I something? Right? And that's the kind of thing that John had a tough time of with. In fact, John's strongest words were directed at the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You notice what he called them? He called them a, a brood of snakes. Basically, a saying, you have snakes as, <laughs> as your parents. You're, you're the offspring of, of a snake. Um, perhaps he was thinking back to the Garden of Eden story, right? Who showed up as a snake to tempt Eve and, and get us in trouble to start with? Somebody said that uh, nowadays, if Adam was explaining why they got kicked out of Eden, he'd probably smooth it over by saying that his wife ate him out of house and home. <laughs> the Pharisees and the Sadducees thought that they had a special in with God because Abraham was their ancestor. And it's great to have a godly heritage. There are some of you here who had the privilege of growing up in, in Christian homes. Mom and Dad loved the Lord. They brought you to church. Reading the Bible and prayer was a part of your life at home. Maybe you grew up and, and just kept coming to church, but never really made it personal. You know, Billy Graham has a saying, he said, God has many children, but no grandchildren. We all need to come personally to God, confessing our sins, receiving Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. Once you have made peace with God on His terms, you can begin to experience His peace in your life. The peace of God which passes all understanding. It's 
it's great to have a Christian heritage. And we thank God for it, those of us who have been blessed in that way. But whether or not your parents and grandparents were Christians and believers in Jesus, it's so important that you know for sure that you have a relationship with God through faith in Christ. His presence gives you peace even in times of trouble. Now this doesn't mean that things are going to always go well for you because you're a Christian. I saw a plaque here just recently that said, Peace is not the absence of trouble, but the presence of Christ. Corey Ten Boom, who spent horrible time in a Nazi concentration camp, said later that we need to realize things are not falling apart, things are falling in place. What a thought. An unknown author penned the following penetrating lines. Peace does not mean to be in a place where there is no noise, trouble, or hard work. It means to be in the midst of those things and still be calm in your heart. Mm -hmm. Repentance is necessary before we can experience God's peace. But we are mistaken. If we think that we are forgiven because we are sorry for our sins. The reason that our Heavenly Father forgives our sins is because of the death of Jesus on the cross. That's the basis for our forgiveness. The repentance is merely the result of realizing that Jesus paid the debt for us. You see... If Jesus hadn't died, if he hadn't shed his blood on that cross at Calvary, it wouldn't matter how sorrowful we might be about the wrong things we have done. We couldn't be saved. It's Jesus' death that makes it possible for God to forgive us. He has credited what Jesus has done to our account. We talk about salvation as a free gift. It's free to us, but it cost God everything. It cost him his one and only son. When we realize this, the limitless peace of God begins to grow within us. No matter who we are, no matter what our background, no matter what we have done or what we have been like, God restores us to a right relationship with himself only by means of the death and resurrection of Jesus. The Bible says there is no other name given among people by which we must be saved. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You see, a lot of people have the idea that God is just like a uh, benevolent grandfather. <laughs> that when we do wrong, he just pats us on the head and says, there, there, it's all right. But sin is not all right. Sin is all wrong. It's all wrong. And it's only the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that makes forgiveness of that wrong possible. So, today... I want to challenge you to live as though someone died for you. Because someone did. And not just anyone, but God's only Son, Jesus. He died for you. His peace is yours. He died for you. Will you live for him. Let's pray. Father God, we don't want to be like the Pharisees and Sadducees who came to hear John, who were relying on their own righteousness and their fortunate heritage. 
Instead, we want to come as sinners, confessing that we have offended you by the wrong things that we have done, the things that we have spoken, and the thoughts that are not right. We confess that we are sinners, but how we thank you that we are sinners saved by grace. That when we come to you confessing our sin, you will under no circumstances reject any one of us. It doesn't matter what we've done. It doesn't matter what we've been like. When we come and confess and receive Jesus as Savior, you make us new creations. The old is gone, the new. And when your spirit comes into our life, then we begin to live lives of peace. Peace even in a time of trouble. Thank you for a new life through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Thank you that as we come to the table of communion, we remember what Jesus has done for us. The giving of his body, the shedding of his blood. We praise you, Jesus. We recognize and honor you today as Savior and as Lord. Amen. We're going to ask those who are <coughs>